Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Baumhauer's Victory Grill. A big thank you to Bob Baumhauer for hosting Hey Coach and the Nick Saban Show and for being Alabama's official watch party location this season. Baumhauer's Victory Grill, legendary fun, legendary food, and I'm sitting next to a gentleman who himself is a legend, a Heisman Trophy winner, Davey O'Brien Award winner, and he's done so well in his broadcasting career. Andre Ware joining us. Great to see you, my friend. How are you? It's great. <clears throat> great to be here. As I mentioned earlier, it's always good to come back and, and uh, just kind of see uh, Tuscaloosa, my neighbor, my next door neighbor. His daughter is now a, uh, a student at the university, really? so I've got to give her a call now that I'm in town. And uh, it, it's, it's just a good time. To, it's always good to be here. You obviously uh, played in a very successful program at the mm -hmm. University of Houston. You broadcast for the NFL's Houston Texans, and you're seeing a very young and talented team there. We've got that here in Tuscaloosa. A lot of youth, inexperience, but a lot of talent. There are a lot of parallels between this Alabama team and the Texans yep. in terms of youth and speed. And uh, that's one of the things I think you take away from last week's game against Louisville is that there is a lot of, there are a lot of young players on the team, but there is a lot of speed to go around. So uh, I think the Texans, in, in a way, are similar yeah. in terms of being young. There are a lot of first, second year players that are contributing. Uh, on that level, but uh, hopefully, as I mentioned, we were talking during the break, I hope that the Texans can just stay healthy. And I think that's every coach's concern, every uh, fan's concern, is just staying healthy for a 16-game stretch and a 12-game stretch. Now, for the uh, Crimson Tide, they're facing a team on Saturday that people probably don't know that much about. But Arkansas State has won the Sun Belt Conference five times in the last seven years. And they're led by a great quarterback, Justice Hansen. He's the real deal. Yeah, he really is. I had a conversation with him last night. We were, we were visiting on the phone, and he, uh, he speaks with a lot of confidence. He knows the offense. It's a place where he tra transferred from Oklahoma. Right. So you kind of know there's some pedigree there that uh, the kid can play football. Uh, he can spray it around the, around the field. Good high completion percentage, and he's got some big, big receivers that, that go up and make plays for him. He does. They've got a lot of guys who have transferred in from other uh, programs across the country. Coach Nick Saban now joining us, as you no doubt gathered from the uh, crowd reaction. And yeah. Coach, always great to see you. And, and how about this guy? We've known him for years, but you talk about anybody wins the Heisman and the O'Brien and is a first-round pick and all that. Uh, it was fun watching Andre in the day. Well, you know, what people don't know is when he was the quarterback at the University of Houston, yep. Jack Pardee, who was his head coach, was my next door neighbor. Oh, really? Because we, we were at the Houston Oilers, and I used to watch Andre all the time. And Jack and I used to fish. We lived on a little lake, man-made lake, and we used to fish on the back porch. And uh, I won't tell you what else we did, but... <laughs> Oh, he had fun. He, he, I tell you what, he was, uh, God rest his soul, was meant so much to me at a time where, you know, as a young man, you, you've got to make some serious life decisions, and, and he was always there. The door was always open, and the gentle giant is kind of how we refer to him. And well, and he, and he certainly was that. I mean, he was as fine a human being. You know, you always remember those few people that just you hold in such high esteem because of the character that mm -hmm. they had. Um, the way they carried themselves, uh, the, the way they led. Uh, they say he was a tremendous player. You know, he was a guy that played for nine years, had melanoma on his shoulder. They'd almost cut his arm off and came back and played for like eight more years or something. So yeah, he, he, he was really something. And making young men into better human beings. Coach, it's something you talk about all the time. And uh, I didn't know Jack Pardee, but from what Andre has told me over the years, apparently... Uh, uh, you and he are cut from that same, uh, that same mold, basically. Well, I think knowing people like that, and I've had a lot of good mentors, and you've heard me talk about them before, starting with, you know, Coach James, sure. but, you know, George Perlis, uh, Bill Belichick. I've had a lot of really good mentors, but, you know, Jack was one of those guys who was a good friend who had a tremendous influence as well. I know coaches, when you, you, you get into where your background and th things of that sort, what did Coach Pardee, what did you take away from him in, in terms of what you've implemented in your coaching, coaching style? Well, I always thought that he had a lot of class. And I think that that's one thing that 
Coach James used to tell us all the time, my college coach, mm -hmm. was whatever you do, you always want to do it with class. You know, do it the right way, represent other people, have compassion for other people, do it the right way, and do it with class. And that's what we've always tried to coach our teams to be. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, I hate to say anything bad about our team, but that's one of the things I talked to our team about, you know, on Monday, uh, is we have always had a classy team around here. Mm -hmm. I, and all the guys that were on the sidelines for the game, whether it was, you know, T.J. Yeldon or Minka or, you know, Cam Robinson, there was a bunch of them at the game because they didn't play last week. You know, they all played with class when they were here. Uh, and I thought at times last week because we got too many penalties and some undisciplined-like penalties that that's something that we could improve on as a team. You know, the other thing that you always stress is uh, obviously the classroom work. And they put out the uh, numbers the other day. You probably saw that the uh, National Football Foundation released uh, the list of uh, universities and how they rank as far as student athletes playing football who received their degrees. And uh, Bama right now, of all the schools in America, ranked number eight among NCAA and NAIA teams, uh, which is just outstanding. I mean, you, you, you stress that, and it's not just talk. It's not coach speak. These numbers uh, verify what you've been saying. Well, and I think there's also an underlying stat that would even make it better. You know, we've had, I think, it's 29 players go out early for the draft in the last mm -hmm. seven or eight years. And every one of those guys would have graduated in a year if they would have stayed in school. Yeah. Now, a couple of them have come back and graduated, so, you know, it's probably not quite 29. Uh, but I think if you couldn't go out for the draft, we'd have even much, much better numbers than that because sometimes we get penalized a little bit for that when it comes to the graduation part of it. But I'm really proud of the job that we do with our players. You know, I always try to emphasize to our players, they, they all seem to want to come to Alabama so they can play in the NFL. And I always tell them, you come to Alabama to get an education because you're preparing yourself not for the NFL, but you're preparing yourself for the day you can't play. Yeah. That's what everybody on our team is doing. And, and you're all coming to that day. All of us who are athletes, Andre, myself, all you guys out there sitting who are playing on our team now, we all have something in common. We're going to come a day we can't play. And that's why you're going to college. That's why you graduate. That's why you develop a career off the, off the field. And most of our players buy into that. We do a great job with the academic support. Um, John Deaver does a great job at our administration. We, we, we really invest whatever we have to to create value in that area for our players. Coach, time to talk about the offensive line, I'm sure, because it's time for our first phone call of the night. Brought to you by Alabama 811. Always contact 811 before you dig to know what's below. Call 811 or visit al811.com. Andre, the first guy who calls in every week is Pee Wee <laughs> from Grand Bay, Alabama. He loves talking the about the offensive line. Big uglies, huh? Yeah, Pee Wee, how you doing tonight? I'm doing fine, Eli. Coach, how are you, sir? I'm the good. I'm the good, Pee Wee. What's up? Hey, I want to add just one more thing to the topic that y'all were just discussing about the list that came out. Since the 2010 season, Alabama has seen 15 players earn their master's degree before stepping on foot for the field for the final time. That's outstanding, sir. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, and that says a lot for – you know, the kind of character quality people we have in the program and that they have their priorities right and that we're supporting them in every way that we can so they can, you know, develop those kind of careers. But it's really the players that uh, buy into what we want them to do that really benefit from getting a master's degree. And we've had, we've had a few. If you look at the stats on how many players we have pl that have played their last game at Alabama with a degree, so in the last five years, like it's something like 126 yeah, or 27 wow. guys. So that's averaging almost 25 guys a game. That they and for those four of those years, we've been in the playoffs. So it's not like we had, you know, just okay teams. But though, that really says that the priorities of what we get done and what get accomplished with our players here is what it should be in college football. Making sure guys do what they have to do to uh, develop a career off the field. Yes, sir. Uh, the question I wanted to ask, Coach, was, you know, uh, early in the game Saturday, 
uh, Louisville was able to get some pressure in on the quarterback and uh, get some penetration on the line. Just wondering, was that uh, something that, that they were doing as far as disguising the way that they were bringing their pressures? Or was there, uh, since it, we got some new guys in there, was maybe there some communication problems? I was just wondering what, what the deal was with that. Well, most of the time, it, 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 most of the errors that actually were made in the game in any part of our team, whether it was the offensive line, the quarterback, um, you know, the defensive backs, the linebackers, I mean, whatever group you want to look at. Most of it comes back to lack of communication. Uh, we make a line call, somebody didn't get the line call, or they stem at the last minute and we change the line call and somebody doesn't make the adjustment, or you know, they're in odd defense, and so when we slide, the guard has to bring the nose guard back if he comes your way, and all of a sudden he overslides and the nose guard goes across his face and gets pressure on the quarterback. So, uh, the, you know, look, the first game tells you where you are. Uh, it should be very clearly defined for every player on the team, every unit on the team, what they actually need to do to improve. That's what the first game tells you. And there's not any part of our team that we can't focus on trying to improve. Most of the plays, I think we gave up 258 yards. 167 of those yards came on mental errors on defense. Somebody did not do the right thing, didn't cover the right guy, didn't get in the right gap. Something wasn't done correctly. So this is just about execution. Uh, and you don't really find out where you are in, in the execution of what you do uh, until you actually play a game. And you usually find out the more experienced players that you have make less mental errors, uh, and the younger players make more. And that's something that goes with knowledge and experience. And there's no substitute for experience. So every player's got to get some. All right? And they're going to make some mistakes, and they're going to learn from those mistakes. And, you know, we had some of those things happening on our team, and I'm sure we're going to continue to happen. But each week we want to minimize those more and more and more so we and I think that's the the best way that we can improve now I can see why <clears throat> he's led the, the nation in defense what the last three years or so in a yes. row because yep. a lot of coaches would just be, they'd be totally okay with 258 yards but then you strive for perfection sure. and that's that's something I think uh, I think every coach should admire or strive to to uh, to, to become so to speak when you have so many talented players yet you don't allow them to ever get comfortable you consistently pushing. That, that's outstanding. Well, let me ask you about uh, Arkansas State's defense, Coach. Everybody talks about their quarterback, and deservedly so. Their defense has 67 interceptions in the last four years. Is it a unusual scheme that they do? Is it the talent that they've got? Why have they been able to pick off so many passes? Well, first of all, I, I think that people don't have the proper respect for Arkansas State. Uh, they play in the same league that Troy plays in, and I only say that because we're in Alabama. Uh, Troy actually beat LSU at LSU. Right. Um, so, and Arkansas State has probably had more success in that league than even Troy has, and Troy has a good program, no disrespect. they've won five of seven championships. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, they play good defense. They've got good players. They play hard. They're very well coached. Uh, I don't think... You know, they're really kind of a split safety coverage type team. They play a lot of, not to get too technical here, but, you know, quarter, you know, type coverages. Uh, and they play the run well enough out of that, which is sometimes, you know, a little, little more difficult to do. And I think it helps them when it comes to their pass defense. And if you can stop the run and play those kind of coverages, I think, you know, it's really, really good. So um, they play hard on defense. Uh, they don't do a lot of different things. They do have some third down pressures that can give you, you know, double A gap stuff, you know, around the center that can give you some problems. And they get some stacks and, and you know, affect quarterbacks. So they play in pretty much of a passing league, though. This is a big yeah. time passing league and a spread league. And uh, they're very, very good at the spread and they're very good on offense. I huh? mean, 497 yards and seven touchdowns in one game passing. Um, their quarterback is good. They got big physical receivers who can make plays on the ball. They're very good. The quarterback's really, really good at back shouldering, you know, when you play close coverage uh, against them on the fade ball. And everybody's going to ask me at some point in time this year why you, you, you don't have your guys looking for the ball. Well, Andre knows. He played quarterback. I played quarterback. But when I played, we didn't have the back shoulder throw. <laughs> Nobody played bump and run. But, <laughs> uh, 
but but nowadays when you play bump and run, if you have a guy cut off and you're playing good coverage on him, the quarterback just throws the ball to his back shoulder. And if you look for the ball over your inside shoulder, you keep running. That guy stops and catches the ball. You look like a fool. So you have to keep your eyes on the guy longer in the down through what I call the move area, which is about 18 yards down the field before you can look at the ball, look for the ball when you when, when you're playing against a team like this. And these guys are good at it now. They're not just OK. They're good at it. So. Uh, I have a lot of respect for this team. I have a lot of respect for their coach. Uh, they're well coached. They got a really, really difficult scheme to defend on, on their offense versus our defense. Uh, so we'll get challenged in this game. Yeah, they, they, their coach has won 32 games there. 30 of them, they've won by 10 points or more. So, uh, and uh, they are a tough bunch. Coach, you have a visitor here to your right uh, here at Baumhauer's with a question. and. He is wearing a Mercedes-Benz shirt, so he is certainly welcome. Good evening, sir. Good evening, uh, Coach Saban. Uh, with all these new players coming in every year at all different positions, which position group takes the longest to develop to get to the standards that you expect them to play? Well, I, I think um, probably the skill positions on offense, which would be wide receiver and running back, are probably the easiest you know, to learn and develop guys at. Uh, because if guys have great skill, you, you can utilize the skill even if they don't know the whole scheme. You know, we had a wide receiver at uh, LSU once, and I won't mention any names. He was a gold medal fast guy. And he struggled learning when he was a freshman. So I said, OK, let's teach him three routes. So you run those three routes, and you do it well, and nobody can cover you. We'll be fine. All right, so you don't have to play the guy the whole game. If you're an offensive lineman, you have to know every single call every, uh, on every play, every pass protection, and you've got to work together with somebody else most of the time. So togetherness is important. Knowledge is important. Application is important when the defense changes. So I would say the offensive line is probably one of the most difficult places to, to, to play and develop early in your career. So defensively, probably linebacker, uh, because more things happen. You got runs, you got passes, but we've had a lot of linebackers play here as freshmen, and we've had a lot of DBs play here as freshmen too. So, um, you know, it's just about teaching, and I think in this day and age, it's harder to play defense because the offenses are so much different, and you see so many more multiples of offense. You know, it used to be everybody ran high formation, pro slot formation. Now, every week we see something that is completely different. So if you don't have a base knowledge and experience I, that you can draw from when we have to change from week to week in terms of the style of play they play on offense, then it makes it very difficult for you because you don't understand the basic concepts to start with. So uh, it's more difficult to play defense early on than it used to be. Uh, but I'd say the most difficult is the offensive line. Second and goal from the nine. Off the near hash mark. Tua calls his own number. Takes off to the left sideline. Cuts to his right. Walks it in. Touchdown. A great block by Damian Harris as he pushed D. Smith out of the way, allowing for the nine-yard touchdown scamper by Tua Tungo Maloa. And of course, uh, too, obviously a very talented uh, young man, but when you've got that kind of blocking, uh, it really is very, very nice. And Andre, you know what that's <laughs> like. Uh, when you've yeah. got somebody like that blocking in front of you, man, it makes it a whole lot easier. Well, it was a great question earlier for Coach Saban about uh, you know, the most difficult uh, position or position group to, to, comes, to come together. I, I, I agree, it's the offensive line, and that's why you know, quarterbacks, you see the relationship that guys have with their offensive lines. Um, it's, it's fingers in a glove. All those guys have to be working together in terms of the communication that goes on up front. Who's got who? Are we sliding protection? Things of that sort. So I sure. thought it was an outstanding question. Hey, folks, a reminder that Chick-fil-A is a new sponsor this season on the Crimson Tide Sports Network. And I just want to remind you that with Chick-fil-A catering available from your local restaurant, you can liven up your game day party in no time. Roll Tide with Chick-fil-A. And for those of you listening in the Gadsden area, former Bama lineman Mike Johnson 
will be at the Gadsden Mall Chick-fil-A location tomorrow starting at 5 o'clock. Go by, say hello, get your picture taken with a great guy, Mike Johnson. Coach Nick Saban with us, Andre Ware, who will be on the telecast Saturday alongside. Coach, our first question from the Nick Saban Show blog. Uh, Alex in Opelika says, hey, coach, the hours of preparation during the season must be very demanding on you and your staff. I'm curious, how much sleep do you typically get at night? Roll Tide. <laughs> well, you know, my problem is not having enough time to sleep. It's just how well I sleep. Uh -huh. you know, I, if I get six hours of sleep, I think that's pretty good. Um, sometimes it's not quite that much. But it's really not because of what time I get home. Um, you know, I try to leave the office at 10 at night on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday, I get home about 7.30. Th Thursday, I'll go home after this show. And then Friday, you know, obviously you're with the team until pretty good late time. But And Saturday, you work. So we probably go about 70 hours a week uh, in terms of work. But... If I get six hours of sleep, I usually can roll pretty good. I hear you. Coach, Andre? Because you've been in this a long time. Um, do you set goals for yourself uh, in terms of how you get better as a coach each and every year? Well, I, I don't know. I, I guess my goals are a little more not about result-oriented type things. Mm -hmm. You know, I know everybody always talks about me talking about the process of how you do things. I think I love the process of – you know, how you try to have a better program, how you try to evaluate every part of your program, whether it's the academic support program, whether it's, you know, offense, defense, special teams, uh, medical staff, uh, nutrition program for the players, uh, whatever it might be, you're always trying to, I'm looking at the, evaluating the process. You know, how could we do this better? How could we make it better? How could we be more efficient? How could it be better for the players? So I think... It's not about we want to win this many games. Um, you know, that's sort of an outcome, the way I look at it. You know, I always ask uh, players, I said, you know, what's your goal? Receiver says, I want to catch 50 passes this year. I said, that's not a goal. That's outcome. <laughs> I, I mean, I'd rather you focus on what do I have to do to be the kind of player who could catch 50 passes right. and be a complete player at my position. So it's a little bit different. But, you know, when we were talking about the hard-to-play position, uh, I didn't, we didn't mention quarterback. And I think this day and age in time, it's a little bit easier to develop quarterbacks in the spread. Mm -hmm. If you're going to develop a quarterback in a pro style system, which we're kind of a semi pro style system, semi spread, I think that can be a very difficult t task, you know, for a lot of people to learn all the reads, the protections, how to protect yourself, where you're hot. Uh, who to throw the ball to, middle of the field open, middle of the field closed. And the decisions have to be made in a quick period of time. Yeah. I mean, most of the time you're going to get rid of the ball in three and a half or four seconds. And from the time you get it in your hand, you've got to make a decision about a whole bunch of stuff as to where it goes. And you've got to deliver it accurately and on time. So that, that's not an easy position. I think easier than it used to be because the spread really simplifies things for the quarterback. You were talking about players, and obviously there's a, a, a bunch of talented players, but when you go out to recruit and you're in the living room, because everybody always looks at the final the, the result the, or, or the final product, so to speak. When you're in the living room with a mom or a dad or a family, what's, what's the, the message that you're portraying to this, this family? Well, what I tell everyone, and this is the philosophy of the program, we want to help you be more successful in life because you were involved in the program in terms of personal development, character, attitude, work ethic, discipline, intangible things for you to make the kind of choices and decisions that's going to help you take advantage of your gifts. So there's a personal development side to it. You know, developing a career, graduating from school. Develop a career off the field. And see if you can develop a career as a football player. You know, those are basically, you know, the things, be more su successful in life, get an education, develop a career off the field. Uh, and, you know, in our case, we know we have a career development program, so we have a whole group of people called the First and Ten Club who actually try to help our guys get the kind of opportunities they want when they leave. Wow. So we're even committed when they're gone. 
you know, to try to help them. So, um, and you know, all these guys want to play in the NFL. So, but we try to help them develop a career on yeah. the field as well. That doesn't last very long either. I yeah, mean, you, that's you what got a small, for. small not, window. Not, not, exactly. not, not for long. Exactly. <laughs> Coach, there's a gentleman here to your right with a question uh, for you. Good evening, sir. Welcome in. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Coach. Thanks for taking my question. Mine has to do with the defense. This year is Bama defense. Now, I realize every year you send a lot of players to the pros. You sent more this time than typically, which means you're starting over in a lot of respects so that you got inexperience and youth. The actual question I have, Coach, is, in your opinion, is there enough talent and all the other qualities that we need that this can become a dominating defense this year? Well, I, I think the issue is going to be this for us on defense. I think we have enough talented players. Uh, I think our first unit has enough talented players. We have quite a few of those players that have talent that don't have a lot of experience. Um, and they're at critical positions. You know, the two safeties, the two, two linebackers. Um, you know, we have new corners. We have new players at just about every position. I think the biggest issue for us because of the number of players that we have lost is we don't have the kind of depth on defense that we've had in the past. All right, so we don't have the number of defensive linemen that we can rotate in and out of a game to keep guys fresh, which keeps you healthier long term, you know, as you go through the season. Uh, we don't have the, the drop off in quality of players at certain positions if we lose players and get players injured. I mean, last year we had, I forget how many games, 30 some, 40 games missed yeah. by starters on defense alone, right, and we're able to persevere that. I don't think this year's team, we're really working hard to develop the young players and the backups that if we, and we've already lost Terrell Lewis, who's arguably a first round draft pick and one of the best players in the country at his position. And we, we, we lost a couple other defensive linemen who were backup guys. Uh, so, you know, that staying healthy and being able to develop those guys every day so that we can improve those guys to the point that at some point in time they're going to be able to play winning football for us down the road is going to be real critical for us. Here now is a second down and 12 Louisville. After that stop by Raekwon, snap to the quarterback pass, throws a fade route into the end zone, intercepted Alabama. Intercepted by Deontay Thompson. He's bringing him out to the 10, up the numbers to the 20, and to the 25-yard line he goes. Between he and Shaheem Carter, Bama getting a couple of big intercepts last weekend. Of course, Shaheem's was a pick six as we welcome you back to Bob Baumhauer's Victory Grill here in Tuscaloosa. The Crimson Tide getting set to meet Arkansas State this weekend. Kickoff is at 2.30 in the afternoon. Our broadcast, of course, beginning three hours early. We'll be on the air at 11.30 in the morning for the uh, Tide and Arkansas State. Andre Ware is with us, great Heisman Trophy winner, Davey O'Brien winner, and uh, former Detroit Lion. Uh, when you played collegiately, was yeah. there a defense that just, I mean, obviously you did so well for so long, but was there a defense that kind of handcuffed you every now and then? Uh, I think um, we went to A&M one year, and they had at enough athletes to, right. to kind of rotate things, and they actually had one defensive lineman and then everybody else was were linebackers or defensive backs, and they would blitz every single down and, and took the shots doing it that way. Really? And it uh, you go into a game like that knowing that you're going to take a little bit of punishment, mm -hmm. but whether you got and, – and the game's protected for quarterbacks a little bit more sure. now, but uh, when you come out of that one, you're, you're going to have a few ice tub uh, visits, no doubt about it. But that was – that would frustrate you a little bit, and the only way to get them out of it is to hit a couple of big ones, yep. and we were able to do that on a couple of occasions. Of course, Arkansas State over the years, Maurice Carthon yeah. was there, Bill Berge might be – well, was before your time, yeah. but they've turned out some pretty darn good players over the years. It's been a great uh, – you look at the coaches that have coached there as well, Gus Malzahn, who's now at Auburn, yep. and – and uh, Hugh Freeze uh, before he went to Mississippi State. So there's been some, been some good coaches along with some pretty good players that have gone through there. We're visiting with Andre Ware, a former quarterback for the uh, University of Houston, played uh, four years in the National Football League with the Detroit Lions. Coach Nick Saban with us. Coach, another question from the Nick Saban radio show blog on AL.com. Rodney in Corpus Christi, Texas. 
Hey, Coach, I follow recruiting closely, and obviously Bama does a great job. I'm curious if it's more difficult to recruit against a former assistant as opposed to just recruiting against other coaches out there. Thank you for all you do, and roll tide. Well, for the most part, I think most of the, the coaches that we've had that have been former assistants, uh, we're always very respectful and thankful for all that they did in helping us be successful. And um, for the most part, they, they're usually, you know, pretty grateful that they had the opportunity and um, they, they appreciate what they were able to learn and being in a successful program. And um, I, I think the, the thing that, you know, you don't want to see is negative recruiting. Yeah. And, you know, when people start negative recruiting and they've been on your staff before, it almost gives them credibility. And the one thing that I will say that we never do, and I never allow our assistants to do, is to negative recruit and talk about the other schools. You know, we have enough good things to sell here that we don't really need to talk about anybody else. And, you know, the one thing that um, I don't know anything about anybody else. I don't know anything bad to say about another school because I don't spend any time worrying about what they're doing. You know, we're wor spending all of our time worrying about, you know, what's, what's, what's happening for us and what we need to do to try to improve our program, our team, uh, the way we go about things so we don't spend a lot of time on the other guys and we don't ever talk too much about them and i just hate it when people do negative recruiting and say things and most of them are not correct most of the time anyway i think they'll give you kind of a sense of pride that you have now you've been in this long enough and you've had enough success that you you have your own somewhat of a, a coaching tree where guys are branched out and and uh, you see all the stuff on espn of who's coached under coach saban then they give you, there's got to be somewhat of a sense of pride. Well, it, it really does. And I'm, I, you know, I'm very, very grateful that we've had some fantastic assistants that have done a wonderful job for us through the years. And, um, and I know those guys did a great job for us because they wanted to have an opportunity to do the next thing for themselves, whether it was an assistant to a coordinator, coordinator to a head coach. Uh, so I'm, I'm always very, very happy and excited and proud. Uh, that those guys were able to come up through our program and uh, be able to uh, continue to have success professionally uh, by being head coaches. A, uh, I'll, I'll ask it this way because I, I look at Gary Pinkle and how he kept the coaching staff together. I think it was for seven consecutive years at Missouri. They were able to turn it around. They had a nice run when he was there. You see here as the coaches move on and become head coaches or go other places and, and take other jobs, how have you been able to sustain this level of success and where everybody, or as it's expected, now your fan base expects you to compete for an SEC title each and every year when there is turnover from within? Well, this has been, this year has been the most challenging year of all because we have six new assistants and a new coordinator in every part of the offense, defense, and special teams. So uh, that has been the most difficult thing for me uh, to try to get everyone to understand how we do things. You know, there, there's what we call the Bama way, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the discipline, how we practice, the effort, the work, the work ethic that the players have to have, uh, how we go about things. And, um, and some of those things are not compromised. They're just not they're not up for debate. Um, and so the more turnover you have, the more challenging it is to get everybody on the same page. Uh, but I think when you have turnover, it also brings enthusiasm. I think it brings new ideas. I said, so there are some benefits to it. But I really do think it hurt us a lot last year because we lost so many guys. We lost relationships. You know, after the national championship game, we lost a lot of relationships with a lot of people, and it hurt us in recruiting a little bit at the end last year. Coach, let's take a phone call here. I am, I'm guilty of neglecting our folks on the telephone here. Jamie in Alexander City has been waiting. Hello, Jamie. Welcome into the show. Hey, Eli. Hey, Coach. How you doing? I'm good. So, I want to go into athletic training, and one day I hope to work for you guys on the team. And we never want injuries, but I was wondering how good the athletic training staff is in getting the guys out on the field quickly 
and how well you love their staff. Oh, you got national championship trainers. Oh yeah, we got, we, yes. we, we have. I yes. tell you what, the medical staff that we have is just phenomenal. I mean, it really is. Um, you know, first of all, Dr. Kane and Dr. Andrews uh, and their clinic uh, is you know our key orthopedic you know folks and they're top of the line. Uh, but because of them uh, and their great physical therapy and rehab center that they have, uh, we get a lot of good people uh, from them and the process that they use. Uh, our people have implemented over the years. Uh, Jeff Allen does a, a really, really good job with, with our players. And I think one of the things that people don't really understand, if you don't have great medical staff and your players don't trust, trust, I mean trust the medical staff, all right, that it's okay for you to practice today, all right, or you're going to be okay, or you need to stay out for two weeks, or you should not play anymore in this game, and the player wants to play. I mean, it goes both ways. Uh, if they don't really trust uh, in those people, you, ha you can have a lot of issues in your program. And I'll tell you what, our players here really, really trust our medical staff because of the, the just outstanding job that, you know, they have done through the years. And um, we, we, they do a great job in rehab uh, and to have the physical therapy and the rehab and Coach Cochran who takes over the rehab at some point in time and have all the equipment that you need to have to have quality rehab. I mean, these things are all sort of really imperative to me uh, for player safety, uh, for the player's benefit, for their development, and for the sake of the program having a chance to be successful. I felt so nice for Anthony Jennings. I feel happy for anybody who comes back from a major injury, but I, I really felt he had a, a bad injury, and to see him back and playing as well as he is, uh, that, that's a nice deal. It certainly is, and, you know, he went through a lot, and he worked really, really hard, and um, it, it really does, you know, make you a little heartfelt for him and his family yes. that he's able to come back, but I know what he went through, and I cer we certainly appreciate it, and we Amen. love him for it. Amen to that. Right. Coach, another visitor here at the restaurant with a question. Good evening. Hi. Um, I understand that Amelie has developed an interest in slime and likes to make it. So can you tell us a little bit about the phone call you had last night and what she did with the slime while you were on the phone call? Well, I think I, ha I, ha I had a um, little lesson in slime last night. Um, I haven't been told to come and sit here on the couch with me for a long time. Miss Terry, I don't think she cares that I sit in my chair. But Miss Amelie said, Papa, come and sit right here. And she had the slime, and I had to get my first experience working with slime. <laughs> All right, so I got coached up on the slime ball. Um, and I still have one sitting by my chair. That's great, that's great. Nothing like grandchildren. We're gonna be right back. We're gonna take a break here. Jacobs, another of the uh, great runners, uh, outstanding special teams guy. It's a, I, I, I don't know if you, uh, Andre Ware is with us uh, as our special guest tonight. I don't know if you heard Kirk Herbstreet last week. He said, you know, with this guy quarterback and this and this, Alabama can score at will. <laughs> maybe yes, maybe no, but uh, the, the, you know, the pick six for Shaheem Carter, the oh, run yeah. back. Uh, it's a, it's a multifaceted uh, operation here. I think when you have a collection of talent that that they have here, and, and it's certainly a young talent, but it's talent nonetheless that you are going to have some exciting moments uh, within a football game, and they've certainly had a few last week. Tell me about your play-by-play -play guy. The reason I bring yeah. it up, you're working with somebody new to you, as I am here with John Parker Wilson and mm -hmm. Rashad Johnson joining our broadcast. Uh, tell me about Kevin, your new play-by-play uh, -play guy. Kevin Brown, he's a Syracuse grad. Imagine that, Imagine working that. at ESPN. Cool but figure, uh, yeah. young, but he looks like he's about 12 years old. But I'm telling you, once he starts to talk, uh, he sounds like he's uh, well beyond his age. And cool. he's very, very good at what he does. Uh, he's very relaxed in the booth, which allows 
me as an analyst to relax a little bit, and he just knows the game through and through. Why don't you throw another question at the coach? Yeah, coach, uh, and when you're out recruiting, give me the characteristics that you look for in a young man that lets you know that uh, he kind of fits the Bama way. Well, you know, first of all, I think we're all looking for guys who love the game. And I, and I think that one of the things that the Internet and the attention that guys get way back, even when they're in high school and junior high now, and we're making guys five stars when they're in the ninth grade, uh, is do you love the game or do you love the lifestyle? And do you love the attention that you get from being a player or do you really love the process of what you have to go through to be a good player? And I think that's what, I, if you ask an NFL scout, I bet you that's what they're trying to find out. That's why they have a combine. That's why do they do interviews. They have psychologists interviewing these guys, psychiatrists interviewing them, because that's what they're trying to find out. You know, really, what kind of character do they have? And we try to evaluate guys in three areas. You know, character and intelligence being very, very important in terms of, you know, most people don't reach their full potential or what potential they have if they don't have character. And, you know, you can say a lot about character, what is character, what you do when nobody else is watching or whatever, but it's really all about, you know, wanting to be the best you can be. Uh, you know, we all have a faceless opponent. It's not the people that we work against or we compete against, it's ourselves. I mean, just like our team, you know, it's a faceless opponent. We're trying to be the best team that we can be. Uh, and everybody's got to buy into trying to be the best version of themselves, you know, as a person, as a student, and as a football player for us to be able to do that. All right, so not everybody really is wired that way. Not everybody is geared that way. So, uh, you know, that's important. Size and speed is important to us, height, weight, and speed. And we also have critical factors as football players that we look for, you know, at every position, which are defined. All right, and I've talked about this, you know, a lot. You know, sometimes... You know, people just go out and they just recruit guys. Mm -hmm. Well, but the guy they recruited, he may be a pretty good player, but he's not a fit on your team, you know, for what you do, what your system is on offense, defense, or whatever. And I learned that from Belichick when, you know, we went to Cleveland. We defined what we wanted, what we were looking for in players, and also the kind of competitive character that we were looking for in players. And it was that same statement, you know, does the guy love the game? Or does he love the lifestyle that the game gives him? And, you know, there's a difference in that because you got to love the process, man. It's hard. There's a lot of hard work. Yeah. There's a lot of ups and downs. Uh, I mean, anybody that's competed in anything knows that there's always disappointments. There's always problems. I mean, we always have things that we have to overcome and work out and work through. And sometimes it doesn't work out in your favor. And you gotta, you, you got to be able to uh, play the hand you're dealt. Uh, and, you know, some of the the, the, the best things, you know, to me are when you do have to overcome something, how do you respond to it? How do you handle it? How, how, how do, you know, and sometimes talent can be the, 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 the greatest bad thing somebody has yeah. because sometimes when people are really, really talented, all right, they, 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 they really learn how to settle for less because they can they can win with their talent. They don't have to be the best. They don't have to challenge themselves. You know, it's, uh, it's like talent is your greatest vulnerability. You know, I mean, because you've got talent, you don't feel like you've got to go do all these things. But really, it shouldn't be about what you have to do to beat the other guy. It should be about what do I have to do to be the best. You know, I just talked to our players about that today. I mean, do you play better when you're behind by 14? Do you play less when you're ahead by 14? Do you play better when you're playing against an All-American than if you're playing against just a good player? I mean, if we were evaluating you and looking at your plays, why would it matter? You know, I tell the players all the time, you know, when I was in, in the NFL, they made a cut-up for me. I, when I looked at the player for the draft, they made a cut-up. So I looked at every player, every play that that guy played. I didn't know what the score was on that play. I didn't know who the guy he was playing against, whether that guy was a good player or a bad player. I was evaluating that guy. I didn't know how many plays he played in the game. You know, we have guys on our team, you know, they're complaining about their playing time. I said, why don't you worry about the 15 plays that you played? Because when they look at you, they're going to look at them 15 plays, and they won't even know that's how many plays you played. So why are you worrying about the wrong stuff? Yep. 
Good. Coach, on that thought, our hour is almost up, so why don't we let's hear your final word for this evening, presented by Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes-Benz, the best or nothing. Well, you know, to me, this is playing in Bryant-Denny Stadium is always a special thing for our players. It's a special team thing for our team. Uh, it's a special thing for our program. We've had great enthusiasm, great energy, great fan support, and it really doesn't matter who we're playing. And I know you all don't have the proper respect for the team that we're playing, uh, but we do. Uh, we need your support. Uh, I think it's important that our team improves uh, because we're looking for the challenges ahead. So, uh, you know, it's not good for recruiting. It's not good for anything else if we don't have a full stadium with people excited about seeing our team play and people that stay there and cheer for 60 minutes in the game. There's nothing that makes me more upset I, then you want our players to compete for 60 minutes in the game. Everybody wants them to compete for 60 minutes in the game, but the fans don't stay there for 60 minutes in the game. I can never figure that out. You want to be a part of the team, then do what everybody else does on the team. Stay there and compete for 60 minutes. Exactly. Coach, thank you, sir. We'll see you Saturday. And Andre, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it's a Always treat having you. you here.